Dave grabs the sleeve of John's tux in his sweaty palm, and the two of them fly to the top of the nearest tower. John glances at him en route, and the look on Dave's face strikes him as that of a man condemned to death. The stars stand out along the skyline, so bright in this new world that the outline of every constellation is crisp and clear, even in the middle of the city. Dave cuts his hands over his knees and stares straight ahead. Yo, John. What do you think about me and Carcat? Um, you two are pretty cute together, I guess. Together? I need you to be way more specific here. Oh, okay. Hmm. I guess I'd have to say you're both cute individually when you're with each other. And you make cute friends, which is why you're cute together. Something about it just works. I feel like I'm saying cute a lot here. For the record, I don't mean you're cute as an individual. No offense. Alone, you're just Dave. But together, yeah, you guys are cute. Together? You mean, like a couple? Dave says this so neutrally that John has no idea how to read it, despite having years of practice reading Dave's many neutral tones. Er, yes. That's exactly what I mean. Why? Didn't I just explain it? Good friends make good partners. You're similar in all the right ways, and different in all the even more right ways. You two balance each other out and keep each other from going off the rails, like when you were kids. Huh. You were both kind of crazy when we were kids. Again, no offense. That's not what I was saying huh about. Oh. I was saying huh because that sure was a coherent Egbertian thesis on the state of the Dave Cat situation. Well, I've thought about it that way for a long time. I think it's what everyone else thinks too. I don't know. If I'd been thinking about it that way, I wouldn't be in this mess I'm in right now. You're in a mess? Yeah. There's a metric fuck ton of shit about to come down on me because I dragged my heels on doing some serious self-reflection. Is this just some more stuff about being gay? Maybe, yeah. Okay, definitely, yeah. It's 110% about being gay. I thought you'd already worked all that stuff out. Turns out, it takes a long time to figure out your sexuality after a childhood filled with repression and abuse. Dave. I mean, yeah, I woke the hell up to my inner potential for gayness in a big way. But then I just kind of pressed the snooze button and rolled back over because we kind of had to fight all those jacks and also create society. Holy fucking shit. There's a gay snooze button? Yeah, man, there's a gay snooze button. Wow. When I was having my gay cool boy awakening, it wasn't a full no homo, but it was at least a quarter no homo. If I hadn't done that, then instead of talking to you about this, I'd be at home right now. A uh, kissing car cat, probably. I don't get this, Dave. Am I your gay confessor or something? You don't need my blessing to go kiss car cat. In fact, I was pretty sure you were already kissing car cat. Nope. In that case, as the Lord Pope of Dave's fully awakened gaydom, I give you my blessing to immediately leave and rectify that as soon as possible. Go now, my child. Kiss Carcat right on the lips. Okay, as much as I appreciate how weird a thing that was to say, it's not that simple. I might not exactly be the expert, but kissing seems pretty easy, Dave. I'm sure it gets more complicated in the later stages, obviously, but I think you could figure out how to get your lips on his without much trouble. No, I mean like... Dave makes a couple of truly useless hand gestures. In the greater fabric of our weird incestuous social group, it might be the wrong move, I think. How so? Because... Jade. John bites his lip. Oh boy. That's a complicated problem, alright. He loves his sister, but she's developed a bad habit of sometimes approaching delicate social situations with all the grace of an elephant stumbling around in a dark room. Right. I almost managed to forget that she was trying to fuck you in Car Cat. Dave snaps his head around to stare at John in shock. Wait, you know about that? Uh, yeah. Did you not? Of course I knew about it. I was looking at the whole thing through several complicated layers of conscious denial, but I knew. It's just that you, like, never leave your house. Well, it probably helps that Jade literally said the words to me. I mean, I may be paraphrasing here, but... Hey, John, I'm gonna fuck Dave and Car Cat. 
What the fuck? She said that to you? What did you say? I don't know. It was a while ago. Probably that it was a bad idea. But I thought it was kind of obvious. She's always had a crush on you, Dave. Yeah, I know. He sighs and hangs his head, leaning forward with his elbows crossed over his thighs. The angle he's at gives John a good look at his eyes, which are boring a deep, miserable hole right into the center of the earth. That's why I think that I should give it a try, I guess. Give what a try? Dating Jade? Yeah, and Carcat. Oh man, Dave, I don't know. That sounds like it could really blow up in your face. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of freaking out right now, if you didn't notice. Sorry, dude, it's just... Do you even like Jade? Of course I do. She's like one of my best friends. No, I meant, do you like like her? Oh my god, John, you're 23 years old. Can you at least pretend to talk like a grown man? Okay, Dave, God! Are you in love with Jade? Dave doesn't answer. His silence says a lot, John thinks. Are you in love with Carcat? That's... That's a big fucking question. That's like the biggest fucking question that ever got asked. It's like the paleolithic megafauna of questions. Like, it's so familiar, but your eyes just glaze over it in denial because it's too fucking big. Why did megalodon sharks need to have such big jaws, John? Uh, to eat smaller sharks? I've never been so fucking terrified by a question in my entire life. Seriously, my heart is pounding so hard right now that I feel like I'm gonna hurl. Well, doesn't that answer the question? Nah, because... Because it's not like I feel nothing for Jade. In fact, I feel a whole lot of things for her. Too many to just tell her off after all this time. I mean, she spent all those years alone on the ship, and I know she missed me. And then Dave Sprite died. Or turned into fucking Dave Petta. I was never clear exactly what happened there. And God knows he didn't make any attempt to clear the fucking air with her. But when I think about it, neither did I. So maybe I'm just a huge asshole who's been leading her on for like a whole goddamn decade at this point. And if I have been, don't I owe it to her to at least try? If that's your logic, Dave, then haven't you been leading Carcat on too? Doesn't he deserve the same chance? I mean, if you think it's the kind of decision you can lay on another person like this, why don't you just flip a coin? He tilts his face so that he can give John a look. The corner of his lip quirks ambiguously. Have you been talking to Terezi? Um... Damn, I thought she ghosted everyone. Not me, I guess. Huh. Anyway, I know you thought that sounded like a really cool thing to say, but I don't really think you grasp the full metaphysical implications of whatever you're quoting there. Dave sits up and leans back on his palms, his voice sounding lighter in a subtle, almost ephemeral way now that the subject's changed to something as easy as metaphysics. He catches John's gaze and makes a rolling gesture with his hand, miming the way a practiced magician would flick a coin over their thumb. Do you know what a coin flip is? Like, universally, I mean, in the grand scale of all the time, space, infinite, strength theory bullshit we're always dealing with. Of course. It's like when you know that you've already made a decision you're reluctant about and need an outside force to show you how you really feel. No, dude, that's dumb. You should know this because you've done the retcon thing. What does that have to do with flipping coins? Okay, so, every time you flip a coin, you're creating an alternate timeline, right? One where it lands heads, and one where it lands tails. But while the coin is flipping, both possibilities exist simultaneously. But what if you knew for sure that you'd make the same decision no matter which side it landed on? You can't. So, it's like the coin never lands then? Sure. Then, if you dated both Jade and Carcat, it'd be like you're winning the Schrodinger's cat paradox. Uh, yeah, that's another theoretical paradox that I think you gotta read up on a bit more there, buddy. I probably won't, but okay. Fair enough. But yes, metaphysics aside, me dating both Jade and Carcat at the same time literally is the issue at hand, and it is that with which I currently and explicitly struggle. Yeah, sure seems that way. So... I don't know, Dave. This all just... It doesn't sound right to me. John thinks about the speech Rose gave him that morning on her couch, about canon veracity and the validity, or non-validity, of subjective actions the further they get from the intended sequence of events. Something about... pillars? 
what is essential, true, and relevant. He remembers those three words, but no other contextual remarks which bind them. That conversation seems so very long ago now. I mean, it doesn't sound... canon. Ugh, not you too. Rose is always going on about canon. I don't give a fuck about canon. Then what do you give a fuck about? Dave sighs and runs a hand through his hair. Doing the right thing, I guess. This doesn't seem hard to me at all, Dave. Go home right now and tell Carcat how you feel. Look, I... I can't. If I did that, it would be like... Like... Like what, Dave? Like you would be really happy? And Carcat would also be really happy? Ugh, I'm not explaining myself right. I need to... Dave staggers uneasily to his feet, staring way past John like he's looking into the infinity of his own soul right now. John's never seen him so scared, and it's over what seems like a pretty easy choice as far as John's concerned. It sure isn't easy for him, though. John guesses this is what it means to be a friend. It means being the guy who understands when easy isn't actually that easy. I have to... talk to Dirk, I think. Uh, okay. John wonders when talking to Dirk has fixed anything for anyone. He's about to ask what exactly it is he needs to talk to Dirk about, but then he remembers what he saw when he went back to fetch Gamzee's fridge in the medium. Dirk and Dave hugging on the edge of the roof, sharing something private and mysterious, the sort of thing that can only happen between two people whose personalities are cracked in the same way. It's not something John's ever had, so it's not something he can understand. An uncomfortable silence lingers between the two of them. Before John can fill it with some stupid words, he hears Roxy calling up to him from below. He pops his head over the roof and waves at her. What's up? Yo, boys, not to interrupt, but we got kicked out of the restaurant for not ordering. What? Really? What's even the point of being famous if that can happen? Lamau, I know, right? I told you I wasn't classy enough for the joint. I got all these breadsticks, though, so we can reconvene in the park. Toads romantic. Ten minutes, what you say. Uh, sounds good. I'll see you there. She grins up at John with shimmering, adoring eyes. They're reflecting every star in the sky, all for him. It makes his heart do a weird somersault. It tries to flip front ways, then backwards, and ends up landing on its face instead. He's feeling too many contradictory things right now. When he turns to look at Dave again, he's practically translucent. Barely there, half out the door emotionally. John feels like he could have done more, like this whole conversation with sand running through his fingers. It itches at the back of his head, the idea that he might have just fucked up Dave's entire life. I'm sorry I couldn't help. Nah, dude, it's not your fault. Dave gives him a light bro punch in the arm and tries to smile. Enjoy your date. 